Um, I guess I'm in my screen. Why don't we officially start the meeting? Thanks everyone for um, jumping on. I'm gonna get to the right meeting packet here. Um, so welcome. First a course of business as always is um, just quickly checking in on the upcoming meeting dates. So the next scheduled meeting is September 15th um, at our normal time. I'm actually going to be away um, and unable to attend. Courtney has offered to help facilitate that conversation, um, but I wanted to just make sure that it that time, date and time worked for others, at least those who are on the call. Yeah, that's fine. I think I, I'll definitely be back in Massachusetts, so the 15th is great. Okay. That's the normal Good. Wednesday. Good with me as well. Okay. Barring school stuff that comes up that's not on my calendar, that is just right. fine for me. But okay. so I will miss it. I will miss the school stuff. I will be at CAP. <laughs> well, we can, if, if needed, we can reschedule, but it sounds mm -hmm. like that's, you know, is going to work for most of most everyone. Um, so the other item um, is just to go through the minutes from the last meeting um, that Brian took and get any feedback on those. They're in the packet. I'm just kind of scanning through them now. Um, and just a couple pages, the presentations that we went through. So both um, Hannah's presentation as well as Courtney's are in this packet um, for reference. So, um, you know, we, Brian didn't take a lot of notes on those presentations, but I think, um, you know, you have the, the sort of the content and the highlights. Any feedback from folks who were able to take a look? Any concerns or questions? No, okay. Hearing none, I will entertain a motion to approve the July 21st meeting minutes. I move that we approve the minutes. Can I get a second? Second. Okay, all in favor of approving July 21st meeting minutes. Please uh, just indicate, raise your hand. All right, we have a majority, thank you. Okay, um, so a couple updates for me, moving on to the chair's update. I know we're, we started a little bit late, but I think we can kind of get back on time. Um, just, uh, I, I know I had um, just asked people for some input on, you know, any because I had volunteered, you, several of you had volunteered to help with the sustainability director search and got some good feedback from Warren and John and uh, others that, you know, you've, you've been engaged um, by Kate, the, the assistant town manager who's, who's leading the hiring. And it sounds like we have from, from the input that you guys provided to me, we have some good candidates. So that's exciting. Um, and uh, you know, hopefully we'll have that search wrapped up in the next couple of months. I don't, I haven't talked with Kate and don't have a time frame, but um, you know, uh, it's something I can. I'll, I'll I'll check in before our next meeting and relay back to Courtney anything I hear, so that can be shared. Um, so wanted to touch base on that, and then the other thing that. I uh, just wanted to update folks on was um, that Hannah, who presented in our last meeting, is kind of finishing up her report. This week is kind of her last week. They just had um, uh, their kind of final presentations for the UNH Fellows Program. Um, so I've just been connecting with her on um, finalizing the report. And one of the things we're trying to do is uh, one of the th things I'm trying to help guide her through is quantifying, um, you know, the potential impacts and benefits of 
um, an investment in energy efficiency based on kind of what Mass Save and others have quantified in the past. Um, it's a little tricky reading through some of that material. So if any of you have insights. I know a lot of you kind of have expertise in that space, um, but if you have insights into some good rules of thumb, she's really just trying to get a high level view for this report in terms of, um, you know, if, if the town decided to finance a certain amount of energy efficiency investment beyond what we're doing today, what would the potential, you know, carbon reductions, energy reductions and dollar benefits potentially be. So um, she's been, we've been sort of struggling through trying to find a good source that um, makes sense for that. And I know this came up, I think Warren, you had brought this point up, which is a really good one about how to put some numbers to it. So if you guys have any additional resources or ideas, um, we're kind of coming down to the wire here, but would welcome, welcome them to guide Hannah in that sort of final section she's trying to finalize. Um, you know, Jake, I had one, um, one comment. I thought it was a terrific mid report, uh, outline. And I had sent, I had sent Hannah some earlier information, um, that I had around the whole financing space, but I was one, perhaps we could help her a little bit by thinking about the next report that she has, if she can actually, um, sort of boil down all of that good information <laughs> into recommendations. So that we would have something to build off of, um, rather than getting uh, you know a good sense of what are the mechanisms, how do the mechanisms work, um, potentially what are the cost of those mechanisms. But for her to you know since she's had a chance to talk to so many of the um, you know the leadership in the town, to really be so bold as to say this is my collective sense of what recommendations I would suggest that we take. And building right. on Warren's um, uh, point that it would be also uh, cloaked in with uh, numbers as good as one can get given the ambiguousness of, um, of financing in, in general. Right. Okay. No, that makes sense. And I think, I think that's being incorporated into the into the report in terms of trying to distill down some key recommendations. But um, yeah. you know, there's 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 always more more you can dig into, and you know, limited time for her for the summer. Right. So, um, I think those were the. I know I had a lot of updates last time. Um, I think that's that's all I had for um, this session. I know we had some a bunch of transitions and membership and everything else. Um, but I want to make sure we have time for um, follow up discussion with Courtney about Envision. And then also, um, we're going to be talking some more uh, after that conversation about kind of priorities for CAB in the coming year um, to see if we can really move from um, all of the learning that we've done over the last year and and try and figure out what are the best next steps for us to um, help guide, you know, the new sustainability director in town. So um, why don't we, why don't we transition over to the Envision follow-up? Courtney, I don't know if you have any kind of additional comments you wanted to make before we kind of open it up to discussion, but I think this, I will just say that I think this, the envision, you know, ties into, um, I think one of the elements around kind of town, town properties, we talked a little bit about, about the middle school project is one opportunity there. Um, but I know everyone had mentioned, we need some more time to talk through this, um, and figure out where this might fit in kind of the toolbox or the prior priorities that we're, we're going to talk about later. Um, I don't know that I have um, a lot more to add. Um, I'm trying to remember uh, where we left off in the conversation. And I think, um, I remember walking away last month um, thinking that I needed to reach out to Matt. And I don't think I, I did <laughs> or hadn't had a chance to, but um, 
you know, I think the, the comment was made, is there a way we could um, almost look at the middle school retroactively? And I think, you know, what really stood out to me as we discussed it is, gosh, you know, now might be a really good time to, to um, look at it proactively. Um, you know, even if we can't incorporate, you know, large sweeping changes, but um, almost as a, as a case study, you know, of opportunities that um, we could look at uh, maybe, you know, in the current design and or could be incorporated in the future design, uh, you know, or future if it can't be undertaken immediately within um, budget. So uh, that was, that's one thing that, that stood out to me. Um, and I think, you know, I think the other, maybe the other just thing to, to end on is, um, you know, that I think I, I couched it as very much a tool for infrastructure, but, but I think there are even further reaching applications that could, um, you know, extend to, you know, departments like planning and or parks and, um, you know, that are infrastructure, but I'd say they're kind of on the fringes, you know, a bit um, versus just the hardcore, you know, built um, systems like transportation and water and sewer and um, telecom, that sort of thing. So, um, but, you know, I think there's maybe some creativity there to, to figure out how to, how to apply it. So, um, yeah, so those are kind of just some follow-up thoughts maybe to get us sort of kick-started back into the conversation a little bit. Matt, I realize that you have have your hand up and I apologize if, if it's been up for a while, I just, um, just saw that. So wanted to let you chime in um, with a comment. Yeah, and I, I realize I'm not a member of the committee, so, uh, but uh, that I did bring up the possibility of using Envision uh, at the middle school building committee most recent meeting. And the feedback, I think one of the architects said that, oh, they were trained on Envision, but that that was strictly for infrastructure projects like bridges and, you know, th that it was not uh, relevant to a school building project. So I was surprised by that. I guess it depends on your interpretation of what infrastructure means but uh i i guess it would that was the feedback and uh i uh, yeah, think that if that's incorrect we need to come back with some evidence to show that no it is applicable to a school building project okay that's that's interesting um it's funny i actually um get comments in the opposite direction um, that, you know, uh, oh, that, that doesn't apply as much to, to um, a straight up, you know, uh, gray infrastructure. That's what we, I guess we call it, you know, be much more outside of the fence, um, you know, green infrastructure type, stormwater type um, application. And, and if you, I guess, if you use that argument, I feel that the, you know, there is a, a site around this building. Um, that's my, my understanding anyway. There will be site improvements around the building and that, that you know, there would be opportunities to think about stormwater and landscaping and irrigation and, um, or lack thereof, or, you know, um, and um, so, I don't know. And all those I, things I, will I would probably come argue. About, but what's special about Envision is I think it provides a framework for balancing the decisions across all of those to achieve this result. Right. And it, it just struck me as it didn't have anything about it that would have precluded the use within a project like this. It seems like right. it would have all those elements. So, right, right. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, so I think that basically the challenge back to this. Uh, board is okay well then how can we just you know show that indeed it is relevant because now i think that the impression at the end because i had no evidence to contradict sure, them sure, uh sure. you know they were kind of like next you know so. <laughs> you know hearing that it makes me think courtney you know you led off with saying about 
being proactive on the school. And, you know, with the largest example of what we're going to be building for a, some time, it seems to me the cab could play a, a strong role to make sure that doesn't slip to a back burner. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing that there's still um, a good deal of ambiguity around the whole solar system design. You know, how large is it? Who pays for it? Is it under Rex? And just a lot of um, open questions that sort of leads me to believe that this isn't on the front burner. And to your point, I think with Envision might be able with CAB to, to get that, that imperative because, mm -hmm. you know, it, we've heard the town manager say that it, it, will, be, it will be a solar system, right? Mm -hmm. We've all heard that. And maybe just being proactive and making sure that he also knows the CAB hasn't moved this to a back burner either. Mm -hmm. That, you know, if anything, this is one of the key things we would be working on for a capital project. So I just think keeping it front and center is, is um, a practical and a tangible thing that CAB can play um, rather than into a larger policy thing. So I like what, you, what you're suggesting with Envision. Thanks, Michael. We have a couple of hands up. Um, so I think John was first and then we'll go to Warren and um, take a comment from Brian, unless we have some other CAB members who feel like we need to cut Brian off. Brian folds off. I don't. Oh, we won't cut Brian off. We won't. <laughs> yeah. He's got all the good ideas. Why would we cut Brian off? We would never do that. I was just kidding. So, John, I know. Please, go ahead. I know. <laughs> yeah. So, I haven't followed, been following the school project very closely, but I assume they're using lead at least for the the project. And so, it seems like there could be this thing of um, complementing using lead for the building and using. Uh, envision for the site and so it seems like if there was a way to, in in lead there's there are site credits but they're kind of um uh it's kind of a light category maybe to be fair um and so i'm wondering if, if there's a way to contrast how uh, envision treats you know would treat the site versus um lead and to make the argument that envision would would add some rigor to the project in terms of the site and whether that might help get some traction uh, for that. Yeah, and the answer on the middle school re regards to LEED is that they have said they'll build to LEED standards, but they won't do the certification. Mm. Right, well, and it depends what level of LEED they'll build to. And and then it's still, you know, you. You, there's some prerequisites you have to meet for each category, and then you, know, you could put on a white roof and and right. a couple of other things, but it's not very rigorous in terms of what gets done to the site. Um, whereas I think in, in Envision, which I haven't personally really worked with, but I think it's more rigorous and therefore it would sort of up the town's game there. Um, but someone would have to, like Courtney, would have to sort of help um, understand the contrast um, so that they can they could see why it might be worth considering it. Yeah, I wonder is is there an opportunity to uh, this would be a question for Matt? I think an opportunity to to talk more with the the um, you know the lead firm or. Or is it a matter of, you know, talking over with the, the school committee? I, I just don't know the process. Well, so I would suggest this way that there is a sustainability subcommittee and that's chaired by Matt Root, uh, who's a Concord citizen. And mm -hmm. I would recommend, you know, approaching him and perhaps it could be discussed at the sustainability subcommittee meeting. And then based upon the response there, you know, move to the general committee. So uh, that might be a path forward. Okay. Warren. Thank you. Um, I found the presentation about Envision very interesting and it seemed like a very useful framework, but I would recommend only using it very loosely. 
I think that it's not a coincidence that there have been so few buildings that have gone through the certification process for Envision. And the reason for that is there's such great differences between these different types of infrastructure projects that what's important to one is not necessarily the same thing that's important to others. And in some ways the scores don't matter so much from my standpoint, because I think you're comparing apples and oranges a lot. Mm -hmm. And that what Envision seemed best at was providing a list of factors and issues that should be considered as part of the planning process, mm -hmm. as opposed to saying, we're trying to shoot for four points here and six points there. Personally, I don't find that so compelling. But I, I like, you know, I like, I got me at least thinking, hey, here's all the issues that we should be thinking about when we do an infrastructure project. And here are some things that are relatively more or less important. And some of those things would otherwise be completely overlooked, but not worrying about trying to score it all. Yeah. Yeah, I think Thanks that's a very, it. a very valid, um, Valid point, Warren, and and I think um, you know I've seen a number of communities use it as a, a as a framework, just as you said, for um, you know, making decisions without requiring every project to be you know Envision certified or maybe LEED is a better uh, you know I think um, example of that. That being said, I think someone mentioned you know you can build to lead standard, but what standard are you building to? What goals are you setting? Um, you know, and what, what role does the town want to play in, in setting those standards? Um, you know, is there some <clears throat> kind of minimum level where you, whether you get the plaque on the wall or not um, that you'd like for, you know, certain projects to be considered for. So in other words, so that so that teams will go through the rigorous exercise of, um, you know, using the framework and actually um, setting goals, um, setting stretch goals for themselves. Um, often that's not done unless there's an incentive, be it a requirement or, you know, a, a monetary incentive of some sort. Brian, um, your your hand was removed. Are you? Would you? Are you still interested in? Sure, I can. I can do a quick comment on the solar at the middle school. Um, so, it's it's the the project needs to move along for Dave to really do anything with the with the solar because he he's already had a statement by the town manager that the light plant will be doing the solar at that site. Um, I don't, I haven't been keeping up to date on the conversations at the middle school discussion, uh, but I know from, from Dave's standpoint that he's been connected with uh, some outside resources and um, he and the town manager have agreed that they are going to be, this, the light plant will be the provider of solar through a third party PPA. So um I know it, it's there's not really much we can see them do because there's really no project in the ground yet. Um, but they they are in they're in the process. Um, they're listening, but there's really not a lot of tangible things yet. I think it will need to get further along to you know approval of the funding for the middle school, an actual building before you see any real engagement from the light plant. Just a follow up question on yeah. that, Brian, because I know we've talked in the past as a group about the high school and how there had been plans, you know, around the high school to potentially deploy solar and how, you know, we're however many years past right. that. And it, is there, um, is part of the light plants ongoing kind of strategy development to consider other opportunities, including the high school and other buildings where if they can find the right model um, that works financially, that they can deploy more solar. Um, 
or yeah, is that too so, early to say? Well, there's, there's a lot of topics in front of the light board and we, we have limited time to put towards any of these particular topics. But one of the things that Wendy committed to at the last meeting was that we are gonna go over each of the topics in the, the uh, strategic plan. One of them being um, more adoption of in-town solar, uh, whether it be supporting incentives for commercial or so forth. Uh, during that discussion, I hope to bring up the 2015 um, article that allowed the light plant to put solar onto a bunch of properties in town that are owned by the town. Um, they have that vote at town meeting that says they can do that. Um, so I want I want to have that conversation about more in town solar at sites like the high school, um, but it's it's buried within the, the the discussions over the next year of each of the eight or nine sections of the strategic plan. Okay, thanks. Um, John, I see your hand up and I, Matt, I see your hand up as well. So. Yeah, I was just a quick, it's on this issue of using Envision or LEAD as a, um, you know, as a guide, set of guidelines. I, I think it's important to remember these systems have structures. There's like a rationale behind it. So they're there's just a system of prerequisites and, um, and then points are weighted uh, based on impact. And of course you can argue about the weighting, but they usually come out of a consensus process among the, a lot of professionals that participate in building these systems. And so I think it would I think it's not a good idea to just use it as a checklist, um, but use it more as a screening and evaluation tool. I don't think it's really important to get the certification, but someone should document the points and meeting the prerequisites and, and sort of why some choices were made and others weren't. Um, I think that that's how we get to a better project. Um, so I just wanted to make that point. This is Warren. I'm not sure I agree with that. And the reason is in the case of LEED, there are lots of similarities between different buildings that are scored on the LEED, LEED system. And so yes, there is a sort of consensus position and there's gonna be differences between buildings, but there's tremendous similarity. When Envision is looking at such a wide range of infrastructure projects from building a bridge to a sewer system, to a road, those inevitably have different priorities and different factors. If we were building a, um, sewer system right next to a wetland and the town's water supply, the points having to do with water quality are more important than everything else put together. And so just using the point system in Envision still seems to me a little problematic. Now, of course, I'm not a building professional, so I could be wrong, but I don't completely understand the logic of using it on such very, very different types of buildings. If I can respond to that, um, I think some of that is built into the, the rating system. There was a lot of thought put into the fact that these this is to be applied to very different, you know, infrastructure systems that are very, you know, are very different. And I think it's why it is um, appropriately vague and that it, it asks the question, but leaves it up to the, you know, the technical and stakeholder team to figure out how best to apply it. Um, I think it also speaks to the fact that, you know, uh, I'd say full, and I, I can't remember the numbers exactly, but a large percentage of the points reside in how that project interacts with the community. 
and does it benefit it? Um, and how, you know, and how, um, and then also how the, uh, you know, the, the community is um, leading in those areas, um, which I think is born out of the fact that these projects are very different and it's not a one size fits all um, kind of situation or there's, you know, where there is so much similarity with buildings as you note, and, and that's completely the case. Um, and I think that's part of why the credits look quite a bit different with Envision than, or the categories that say it as a whole, than with LEED, um, because they can't make a tool that cover, you know, that 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 um, that is so specific, because the projects aren't that similar in general. Um, It's also why it's not a straight point system. That's not the, the award isn't, whereas LEED is, um, it's, you just add up the number of points that you get and that's what it's based on. It's actually based on a percentage of a, the total applicable points. And so, um, you know, there could be a project where only half of the points in Envision are applicable, like truly just do not apply. You don't get penalized for that. You actually um, get to, to cancel those out. And so it's a percentage of your total applicable points. So if you were rating it, that's, you know, you would be able to realize that. So it does, it is applied a little bit differently, I think on purpose to address that one. But I, but I hear what you're saying too um, in, in, in the concern there. Matt, go ahead. At the risk of going off topic, I just wanted to follow up on Brian's comment, which was about the progress of solar uh, at the middle school and, and also elsewhere in town. And just that there was an extensive discussion last night at the CSEC meeting about that the town has actually uh, not allowing uh, large installations to take place on behalf of the network uh, anymore with unless they provide on-site so, uh, storage. And that's because that it, the actual uh, capacity of the solar installations on that segment of the network are so much that that almost reaches consumption at, at some certain times. And so they cannot have a situation where there's a net production of energy because of the design of the system. And so that means that actually installations have slowed down in some areas. And for example, the Fenn School proposed a system and was unable so far to proceed because of the storage on-site storage requirement to be funded by them. So, uh, you know, it, it it seems to me to be a difficult situation that we're kind of entering here right now. Um, there seem to be some impediments. And I now bringing it back to the current topic, is there any way to apply a vision to a larger infrastructure build out like the, you know, the whole process of creating a, a more a sustainable energy production for Concord with mm -hmm. its related storage and you know large scale installations, smaller residential installations, et cetera. I don't know, maybe that's beyond the scope of that, but mm -hmm. uh, I just did want to relay that because I mean, Brian described kind of some of these projects, but uh, the same thing with the middle school, it would have to provide its own storage. Um, so I, sorry, I was on mute, but I, I think Matt, that ties, that can tie into our upcoming discussion about prioritization and um, does it make sense for CAB to, you know, get in, more involved in that issue and engaging with the light board and the light plant and CSEC and others to understand or potentially to propose different strategies for addressing that if we feel like that's an area that we should, you know, that we have the capacity to, to, to weigh in on. So I think that can be part of our discussion in the next session. Um, I think I saw- Yeah, and sorry for taking us off top. No, 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 that's okay. Um, Brian, did you wanna just quickly respond to that? Um, and then sure. I have Jerry's hands up as well. Yeah, just um, so when it comes to solar saturation in our strategic plan from 2017, 
Uh, we have utility scale storage. Uh, seven, over seven megawatts of solar is, is the landfill and the WR Gray site, uh, which are both are responsible, the, the CMLT's responsibility. If we put storage at those two sites, um, the solar saturation, the FEN problem, everything else goes away for the customers. Uh, but again, that was identified in spring of 2017, and we have not installed uh, utility scale storage, decided whether or not curtailment losses from our contracts and our PPA are worth it, or if we're gonna redo our substation and make a contract to give uh, Eversource energy. So. Uh, we have to make one of those decisions. Utility scale storage is, is the plan, but it, it, there's no action yet. So that's, again, why we're going to do once a month, pick a topic in the strategic plan and, and have a discussion. Thanks, Brian. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, Jerry, I, given yeah. uh, your chair of CSAC, I want to make sure you had a chance to chime in on that, and then we can go to Warren. Um, and you. then I think we're going to need to transition to the next topic because we're a little, you know, we started a little late, but we want, want to make sure we have time to talk about prioritization. I think all this, all this fits into that, which is all good. So Jerry, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add a couple of quick comments about the middle school and uh, the, uh, the site, the work that will go on at the site. Um, the PV that will be needed to, or the amount of PV that will be needed for the middle school to reach net zero will require some amount of uh, uh, panels on the parking lot in, the, in a canopy. Um, so that's going to affect the site. Um, the placement of storage on the site will affect it as well. So you're, in your discussion with Envision or discussion of Envision and it's used to analyze a whole site. I just wanted to point out that there are those attributes of the school. It's not just the building, but the, the PV and the storage will impact the site as well. Thank you. So, Jake, I have a proposal for how to proceed. Um, I think rather than just tell the middle school building community to use envision and how to use it. I think it would be worth our while to take an entire meeting of this board, invite one or two people of the build, from the building committee here and go and try to apply envision to, the, to where the project is at the moment to see, you know, can we assess some of these things? Where is there missing information? how easy it is, how applicable is it? Then if we've done some of that ourselves, it would be easier to make a recommendation to the middle school building committee and to others in town, hey, here's a good way to use Envision. Makes sense to me. I, I'm not directly involved with the school uh, now. I was for a time involved with the sustainability subcommittee. Um, but that makes sense to me. All right, I'll mute again. I know one of the suggestions in the past was um, that I think in a past conversation was to meet with maybe DPW and others in town and talk through this. So I think there's multiple opportunities um, and appreciate the suggestion of talking through this in more detail, I think we just have to be, we'd have to kind of carefully think through how to facilitate that conversation to make sure it was productive for everyone. Um, I, I could see this also being something that, you know, if Courtney had bandwidth to kind of engage strategically in some conversations and then kind of come back to the group with some recommendations of how this could, how we could layer this in. Um, so, uh, but thanks for that that suggestion. And then I know, Michael, um, thank you for your patience. No, I think, I think that this is all good. I, th I like the idea of what um, Warren is talking about because it accomplishes two things. One is that the strength of Envision, and we talked about this earlier, is not about a points thing. That's one of the, the uh, fallacies of lead and they got rid of it very quickly because people started missing the whole intent of the framework. And so Envision provides that framework. And then secondly, 
that suggestion that Warren said is that it will keep in the mind's eye of people that we're working with that the cab is thinking about this school in a very deep way. And, you know, we're not in neutral and hoping that, you know, all the design decisions will go right, the light plant will get it right, the distribution, the sizing, all of these issues. I was heavily engaged in the high school. And, um, but, and, and many of you probably have been engaged in different building committees as well. Um, it's all about a imperative. Whatever people are paying attention to and putting out front gets the attention. And heaven forbid that we would ever build the school, even though it's unlikely right now that it would not have a, a solar storage system uh, reflecting um, what everyone wants to see in the town. And in fact, reflects what we put in the climate plan when we talked about, you know, one of the key priorities is um, electrification. So Warren's idea, I think, that builds on both of those and, and positions us cab as, as quite nicely. I like it. All right, thanks, Michael. Okay, um, so what do folks think? Do we do we want to, I guess, vote or, I don't know if we need a vote, but do we want to try and get some consensus around our next step? And do we, do, do we want to engage directly with, um, I know Matt had suggested that we engage with the, the sustainability subcommittee for the middle school. So do we want to maybe propose, um, uh, I guess if we have a full committee, we can either invite them to our next committee meeting on September 15th, or we would have to kind of off cycle, have someone engage with them and then report back. So we could do either of those. Um, any, any thoughts on that or did I miss, did I miss interpret your suggestion, Warren? And you're, yeah. No, I, I'm not exactly sure how to do this. I mean, I was just suggesting not for us to do anything definitively, but for us to just understand and vision better with somebody like Courtney who understands the system to try to go through and see how those different criteria apply to the, that particular project. Okay. John? Yeah, I, I'm, I think it's important to keep, keep in mind that Envision's the tool, right? It's not the goal. Um, and so I thought contrasting, say, if they're using lead and covering like the site with lead uh, to, under, to help have Envision help us understand, well, what's missing if they only used lead, right? What, um, values or not, you know, are, I'm not sure if Envision, say, covers, you know, the materials that go into the storm drainage system and the embodied carbon of it, that kind of thing. But if those are important issues, then LEED's not covering that. And if, and if Envision can uncover that and um, bring that into the design of the project, then, it, then it's useful as a tool that way, right? Um, so, I, I think ha using Envision to, and contrasting it to, to lead might be a useful way to frame some discussion. I might suggest um, sort of a two-step approach, I, Jake, to what you said is, is maybe engaging first off cycle with um, the subcommittee, especially given that the last conversation about it was uh, that's not really useful here. Um, so there might need to be a little bit of um, just a conversation as, as John suggested about you know, what they are using, how they're using it, you know, what, what information is going into it. And, um, and I, I mean, I, I'm happy to do that um, given that I understand how Envision works and I can kind of speak, you know, to, to how the two differ and are similar and that sort of thing. Uh, if that is makes sense and that's the right path forward, um, I just want to make sure that I, you know, I, work within the process that the town process, in other words, and doing that. But 
I, then, I think that makes sense to me. And I think we can also maybe, um, I know that the sustainability, I, I'm, I thought that they presented to us or maybe I was on a call that they were presenting. I can't, I can't for some reason, can't remember, but yeah, they did. Um, yeah. So Matt Root yeah. was on that yeah, call. Matt Root you know, was. They, they talked about embodied carbon and, you know, mm -hmm. a bunch of different things that were all promising, but that was several months ago. So I mm -hmm. think it would be helpful for us to understand, make sure we're caught up on everything they're doing on the built environment and what's happening on the site, which is really ties into the Envision. And we can provide perhaps some, some feedback and try and figure out how we can engage both maybe there are opportunities on the, both on the built side. Um, I know it's getting later, so we just don't, um, we, we have to be, I think, thoughtful in how we engage. Um, mm -hmm. but, but I think it does make sense, particularly on the site so stuff that was sort of dismissed that we reinforce that there are still opportunities. We think there are still opportunities there to be thoughtful and to use this framework. Um, and reinforce that, you know, we're supporting solar and storage and mm -hmm. all the other good things. Yeah, it might also be, you know, if we initiate the conversation, but then also invite them um, and, and they're willing to do something like a, a workshop, um, it would be a good opportunity for us to get an update on the building as well. Right, right. but having that connection, Jake, I think what you're getting at there is two months have gone by. An mm -hmm. awful lot has happened in that school. I mean, we've all been reading about it. Tremendous amount has been happening. And, and, and maintaining that continuity, mm -hmm. that maybe there's something we can do to help. Maybe we are just being informed. Um, you know, cal we, we, we could be involved in calibration of some kind. It's just, it's just a good practice, I think, to have our most important capital project happening that we're, we are engaged, whether it's on the sidelines or whether there's something purely uh, active that we can do that, that helps them. And they may come back and say, things are going perfectly. You know, everything we uh, put into the programming, right? And everything we put into conceptual design, it's all coming out in schematic. Uh, down the road, we're confident that the light plan is going to do all the different pieces to pull this off. But we wouldn't want to be behind that and being, you know, engaging up front. I, I think it's just a good practice. I would vote for that. <laughs> No, sound, sounds good. I, I don't know if we need to vote on it. I think um, I think if, uh, if Courtney, that would be great if you could um, reach out and engage. And I think we can work on coordinating this. Maybe if you could mention the September 15th meeting and seeing if we could get a, another touch base. Um, and, you know, I, there may need to be some additional conversations that you have with the different folks, but um, I think I think that's a good next step coming out of this and a more, you know, a tangible step for what we can do here with Envision to start and then, you know, how it could potentially be applied going forward. So, okay. Great. Um, I um, think here's, a, here's the email that I'm about to send Matt Root. I'm attending Climate Action Advisory Board meeting tonight where the board considered possible ways to leverage the Envision Sustainability Framework. I reported the short discussion we had at the last building committee meeting that concluded that Envision wasn't applicable to this type of project. The CAB members believe that there's still an opportunity here. As a first step, I'm copying Courtney Eaton the, of the CAB. Uh, I think the two of you should have a conversation to decide whether it'd be worth adding to uh, Envision to a sustainability subcommittee agenda or alternatively a discussion at uh, with building committee members at the September 15th CAB meeting. Awesome. Thank Great. you so much, Matt. Just trying to be a lazy. Getting stuff, getting stuff done for us, Matt. Awesome. Love it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, if we're okay, I was plan hoping to transition to our next topic, which I think, you know, it's all kind of related. Um, and I, so I mentioned this before, but really just want to get us, you know, we've, we've spent a lot of time learning about different frameworks, different options. So we talked about home energy score, you know, John uh, kind of educated us on commercial building 
um, disclosure and, and monitoring. Uh, we've learned about Envision. We've, we've talked about a variety of other things that I apologize that, um, you know, obviously we spent a lot of time on Article 31. And so I think trying to think through what can we, what can we do that will help, that will, you know, get us to a specific action point where we can recommend a policy or recommend a program or take other action to engage the town or the new sustainability director on some of the topics that we've already talked about. So I put together, um, and I'm just going to share my screen. I put together just a Word document um, outlining some of the climate plan priority actions where CAB is mentioned as a key partner. A lot of this is in built environment. And we sort of, we talked about this a while ago. We had, there was a different version of this document. And I think we've actually, we've, we covered a lot of topics. I think this is, you know, we're now gone through kind of an education phase. And this is really to, um, again, refine, where do we want to prioritize in this coming year? How do we want to engage the town? And what do we want to sort of double click into and really focus on as a group to, to get done? And I apologize for my, my, my golden retriever is kind of whining in the background here, but um, <laughs> so if that, that's, that's not my stomach, it's not, you know, it's not my child or anything that's, you know, but it's uh, just, just the dog, I apologize. Um, so I put down some potential activities based on what we've, you know, already have in the works, just as kind of, I guess, thought starters and follow-ups but really just want to get some dialogue around what people have been thinking. And I, I had reached out via email, just asking you guys to think about this a little bit. Um, and just kind of open the discussion. This will probably take some time for us to think through and maybe, maybe it won't, uh, I'm not sure, but does anyone want to chime in with their thoughts on where we really need to kind of focus in on this this coming year. And Scott, I see your hand up, so you can go first. Yeah, thanks, Jake. Um, so I had this might even be actually stepping back to a even a slightly higher level um, from from what's on the screen here. But so I was taking a kind of a fresh spin through the sustainableconquer.org site and specifically on that um, the action plan uh, that lays out you know the five different priority action areas and um, had a question for I don't know Jake if it's if it's you or if others in the group might be familiar as well but you know as, as you go through each of those in more detail you can see this sort of status bar it's like the thermometer that shows how far along we are on each of the the action items and I was I guess I'm curious if anyone knows how accurate or up to date that is because I was I was struck that um, you know the built environment uh, section, for example, like ev every one of those items is is at kind of the lowest um, you know status level of awaiting resources, and I think that's the only section of the five that that's the case, um, and I it, it, you know. I guess it, it raised a lot of questions for me around, okay, you know, the built environment is um, the, the, you know, most significant area of emissions in the town of Concord. And is it actually true that that's where we're making the least progress uh, within the five priority action areas? Um, so anyways, kind of a, a general set of questions there to, to help establish that sort of baseline understanding for this discussion. But I think if if that is the case, then uh, I think what's on the screen here makes a lot of sense to kind of key in on. Yeah, I mean, I would say I think that's that's still pretty accurate. Um, you know, a lot of those elements, you know, the the they ha we haven't figured out, town hasn't figured out necessarily how 
how do we go beyond what we're doing today um, in terms of energy efficiency, in terms of the incentives we have in place? How do we improve driving residents and commercial entities to reduce the impacts of buildings? So I don't think a ton has changed there. Um, I think that Article 31 and well, the the mass um, that the building code change, the net the stretch code changes, I think will impact new construction, but doesn't really address existing buildings. Would anyone else disagree with that summary? No. Yeah, I would agree with trying to do something around existing buildings is that, you know, it's easy to take on new development because no one likes new development. Um, but the biggest part of the problem is what's here already. Um, I guess the other thought is it would be good to be thinking strategically about what needs to be changed sort of structurally to move forward. Because, you know, for instance, I don't really think more incentives are necessarily going to move the dial uh, too much unless some of the structural issues are dealt with. So like, you know, I thought the discussion about solar saturation was interesting. I wasn't that aware of it. And that's a big structural problem, right? If you don't solve that, then you can't put the solar in and we're not gonna meet our, our goals. So and so identifying those kinds of barriers, I think um, are important so that we can start to address the structure that then enables us to, to move forward. So like, um, you know, so I think you could argue that, you know, awareness by building owners of their carbon footprint is key. So, you know, I like the idea you've been bringing to us, Jake, about the home energy score. I mean, commercial buildings might account for more emissions, but the home energy score is going to engage more people and help build community awareness and support for <laughs> bigger pushes, I think, or at least we could one could maybe argue that. And so I could I could come up with a rationale why that might be prioritized. Um, on the commercial building benchmarking, I mean, the only thing I think maybe might speak for that is that you know, I'm aware that because I've been talking to a few towns that are interested in adopting uh, benchmarking ordinances or bylaws. Um, and so it could be that you know, there's a window of opportunity to work with some of the other these other towns, both in terms of you know building political support and helping each other along, as well as possibly building um, creating a way to administer these requirements together that reduces the cost of the towns. Right. Yeah. Thanks, I guess. Tom. Jake, I went back and as you requested board members to, to go and look at the full plan, it had been a while since I read it, and particularly um, targeted on, on the blueprints, right? And, you know, there's five sort of foundational pieces to deal with, including what we're talking about here in the built environment, and there's like 25 or 30 actions. And, you know, I'm glad you summarized it here, because it just seems in my mind's eye that the most important action we can take to try to get anywhere near uh, what we published as greenhouse gas reduction goes is, is to dramatically increase electrification. There's lots of other stuff we could do, but you know, certainly if we could look at um, uh, electrification and we have the municipal light plant that's, that's um, working on an initiative right now you know, with uh, abode and trying to think about what are the barriers to getting more citizenry and conquered to go to even a 50% solution, let's say for electrification. Uh, and it's very soft, it's very soft. And initially I had hoped as we were starting off on this journey that we would have far bolder 
uh, steps being taken, almost like some of the other cities and towns that we've already been reported on, whether it be, you know, Boulder, San Diego, you know, some of the real big leaders out there, and that we would move through the municipal light plant, that they're most poised as our energy delivery company to really help us think about going to scale. And, and I think they're proceeding on a pathway. And I'm not sure that's the pathway that's going to be active and bold enough for what we could do. And if we look at the experience we had, what I think was probably one of the boldest things is, is, is getting Article 31 passed. And maybe the next one is another article that says that, um, you know, all residential new construction will have a solar storage element to it. I mean, it sounds like we'd never get that through town meeting, right? But we didn't think we'd ever get through um, uh, in a positive way that we could influence all new construction by eliminating fossil fuels. So I don't have an answer to how we could, you know, take electrification singularly in the built environment and, and, and work up really um, significant, you know, uh, movement forward that gets back to what Warren has said from the very beginning. Um, let's get the numbers. Let's show the numbers that we're actually doing um, what we really have all, you know, set out to do. And one other thing I'll close just by saying that uh, there was, um, I was surprised to find that in there, in our plan, we talked about updating the town's municipal energy plan. And I was going back in my head trying to think about, I can't remember reading the town's municipal energy plan. And are there pieces within that, that, you know, that we should, uh, that we should, you know, try to build off of. And the other thing we mentioned is if we find that the light plant isn't going to be moving at the speed we might have all hoped, right, that maybe we work with, um, and I think this was brought up at our last meeting, maybe we start working with um, the, uh, the planning boards and start developing independent um, uh, policies or ordinances that are appropriate for CAB and the planning board to collectively say, that's what we should be doing. Let's do that, you know, that kind of thing. So that was my reaction. Thanks, Michael, appreciate it. Um, good, good, uh, good feedback there. Um, Warren, see yeah. your hand up. Thanks, I thought um, both John's comments and Michael's comments are wise and we should take them very seriously. Um, I think, the home energy score program in particular is something, Jake, you put on the table. It's something that could potentially make a significant difference. We should invest a little more time and energy to coming up with a concrete proposal related to that. And the same thing as John was suggesting, um, do we want to have a concrete proposal on commercial building um, benchmarking. I think Michael's right that we should dramatically improve, figure out what we actually can do to increase electrification. I don't think that's an easy thing. And rather than just jump on something, we should invest some time and energy into that. And then the only thing I would put on a, in addition, and, I, and this is going back to our last conversation, it, and I was thinking more about that conversation with Envision. We're dealing with it, and, and I'm, I'm the biggest offender here, dealing with it too casually. We're trying to make recommendations as a committee based on a half hour presentation by one committee member. If we really wanna make a robust recommendation to the town, that they will use an infrastructure project after infrastructure project after infrastructure project, we should really invest some time and energy into it. What I mean by that, let's get somebody who's used Envision in a town project in another town to come and talk to us. Let's get somebody who's a critic of Envision to come talk to us. And let's have a series of discussions on that so we could try to come up with a 
um, really robust recommendation rather than treating it so casually. Thanks, Warren. Good, good feedback. Um, I see Brian's hand up, probably in relation to some of the comments on solar. Brian, go ahead. Um, yeah, so it's it's actually about uh, Mike's comments about uh, electricity and electrification. I don't think I mean CAB is the policy making um, climate board, and you we've. The, the, you've done a great job making the, the plan. Um, the light plant has a strategic plan uh, that was made in, in uh, 2017. The best thing CAB could do on electrification right now is pressure the light plant to follow through on many of the things it's been obligated to do through either town meeting votes or through plans and reports. It's got plenty of information. It's just not following through on, on these things that, that it said it would. Uh, so if this committee wants to put pressure onto the light plant to really fulfill on the strategic plan it laid out, uh, that would be helpful. Thanks, Brian. And I, I was thinking about that when I was looking at the, um, the action plan. And you know there are a number of metrics that were developed you know, to, to track progress. And, you know, some of those are ultimately, you know, you would point to the light plant to sort of be tracking that um, probably in partnership with sustainability, at least initially, but that's a perfect, I think, probably a question for us to say, well, how, <laughs> you know, we, I, I can't remember the, the specific goal on, on number of homes elect electrified by, um, by 2030 or 2025 or what, whatever it is, but it, there was a significant you know, proposed number and I'm assuming Kate engaged with, with the light plan and Dave and team. And so I think part of it is just sort of asking for an update on that and, and making sure that we're pressuring, you know, this is like what's happening with the strategic plan, what's happening with solar and storage and some of these things that tie into electrification. Um, I'll also just add that um, Jerry and I, so Jerry, the uh, Frankel, and the I think he had to drop off uh, the call. But as the chair of CSAC, we've just been talking about ways that um, you know CAB and CSAC can kind of work in complementary ways to reinforce um, and drive action. And I know there. They've identified as focus areas really um, a lot around residential energy efficiency and electrification, and um, they've talked about you know a goal of of getting 250 homes kind of through the process of electrification. Um, but we don't even necessarily have some of the data that we need to to, to really try and drive that. So, for example, if I were the light plan and I was trying to drive electrification, I'd probably look at every single homeowner that is heating with oil today, and I would target outreach to those, and propane probably as well, and I would target outreach to those because every day that goes by, those, those homeowners are shifting to natural gas if they have access to it, and it's time to upgrade their equipment. So you're, you're losing that, and it's a, a revenue opportunity. So there's there's a direct incentive. I don't, I just don't know if there's really the light plan is focusing on that um, and to what extent they are. So I think just having that type of conversation where we talk with the right town folks to get more insights and CSEC can help with outreach to those residents. We could just put pressure on the town and sort of against the plan and advocate. Um, so I think there's opportunities there that tie into Absolutely. this. Um, um, and also and just, yeah. I, I also wanted to mention, Mike had brought up, um, I forget what the name of the report is that you haven't seen before, uh, but that report was written in 2010 and uh, the light plant agreed to do five megawatts of solar installation every five years um, for a term of 25 years. And they know that they're behind and, and the, the director has come to the light board saying, that plan needs to be reviewed. It's, a, it's another way of saying we haven't met our targets, so let's 
reevaluate change the, target. change the targets. <laughs> so yeah, it would be good to to you know uh, there's there's a real lack of follow through, um, and, and I'm quite frustrated uh, with that. And um, and the more voices sharing that that frustration of you know this is what the citizenry that your customer base of your your you know community operated MLP has asked you to do many years ago, and you we still haven't seen any any work product. Um, so it would be helpful to, to continue to, uh, to do those. And, you know, even though it's a 2010 report, it had a 25 year term, it, it should still apply, but, um, but he wants to rediscuss it. So anyway, I, I'm going to stop talking and let you guys get on with your meeting. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, that, I, that, I mean, it's a good point. There's another way I think, uh, cab can, play a role is to throw light on the issues and the pro yeah. progress and lack of progress, right? Um, so, you know, I think anytime we can have metrics and can put the numbers out there, it makes it, I think it makes it more likely that, you know, there'll be some attention paid to something. And so I don't know if, you know, another role might be to come up with a way of putting out a indicators report that you know does has that that, that function um yeah that can be a, it can be a lot of work and so i think you want to be careful about how to do it but um if we was like key key strategic things the city the, the town needs to do then maybe we can come up with a sort of green light you know, yellow light, red light kind of indicator report um, on a regular basis that sort of keeps the heat on to move, move, make progress. And I, I think I, I like that idea. And I think, you know, we've sort of, we had been de not depending on, but Kate had really been helping serve as that interface between us and the rest of the town. But I feel like the sustain, any sustainability director that comes on board, like they're, they have to walk this line of, you know, they're, they're trying to get cooperation from all these groups and balancing all of these things and trying to get push, kind of gently push people along while recognizing all the limitations. And so we might be able to um, help them by, again, we have to also recognize some of those, those challenges, but but we may be able to push a little bit harder to make their job easier. And I think just, we have to choose the right thing. So it's not, wow, that like all cab does is complain that we're not doing enough <laughs> kind of thing. And they're not bringing any solutions. It's sort of that balance between, um, are we making thoughtful suggestions and recommendations that are based on, you know, good policy and facts and science and all that good stuff, but also are we pushing where we're seeing lack of progress and we feel like there's legitimate opportunities. So I think, I think that's a good point and something for us to keep in mind um, as part of, part of what we could, we could pull together. And it's just a matter of, do we, how do we, how do we kind of stay on that in a way that's um, that we could, that we can actually keep up with um, and maybe the sustainability director can help, but we're the ones who are, who are, you know, communicating out about it, right? Maybe they're the ones that can help with the metrics, but we really kind of advocate on their behalf. Yeah, I, I think that, I think that's a way it could be done as, I mean, staff, the, the sustainability director can pull together information, but the report comes from the board uh, so that, it's not the director that has to take the heat necessarily for people not right. being happy. Right. It's almost like we have basketfuls of what to do, yeah. basketfuls. And, but when we come to how to do it, there's too few. And maybe it's helpful building off of what Jake, what you just said is that, so if we already know that 32 or 36% of the town is heating with oil and we, we want to do a very bold and, and, and substantive electrification, what would we do about, you know, setting 
goals and targets quarterly that we convert, you know, 15 homes every quarter. And we aim for that 300 um, that I think it was, was put out there so that we start to see um, the material that matters, but we also see progress toward it. And, and then zero in on just one or two things that we can just really grab onto instead of the many things that we have available for us to grab onto. No, it's a, it's a good point, right? Because we, it's, it's too easy with, we basically have, we have 12 meetings a year, right? Uh, right. We don't skip a meeting once a month. And um, so I think that's, that's been our challenge. That's every committee's challenge that has this kind of cadence, right? It's like, right. what can you actually drive forward? And, and I think it's going to take some of us, you know, digging in a little bit on a few things and doing some off cycle work, right. Which we've talked about in the past. It can be challenging with everyone, how busy everyone is, but I think right. there's a little bit of that. It'll help when we get a sustainability director, but I think we can, there's a lot we can do um, with what the foundation we've built. I think if we stay focused um, and target in. So what I, maybe what might make sense is, and I don't want to close this conversation. We've got time. We've got about 15, well, we've got about 20 minutes um, before we go to public comments. Um, but I think what I can do as a follow-up is kind of um, clean this up. I've just been, I've been taking very, like you've been seeing, I've just been typing stuff in. Doesn't necessarily make sense where it is but I can maybe clean this up and then maybe we can get some feedback from everyone. I think we can do this via email because we can talk, you guys, we can talk about it the next time and align, but maybe get some votes back on what people think we should really focus in on. We've already heard some of that um, from, from many of you. And, and then we can talk a little bit more about the how um, and who can help push some of these things forward. And, you know, I'd be happy to continue to push the home energy score piece forward, um, for example. So happy to, to do that. I think we've, you know, I think there's an opportunity on the electrification side as well. Um, but that, I think that's what I'm thinking about as far as the next step with this to maybe get a little bit of voting, some sort of um, prioritization of what you're most excited about. And we can kind of, bring that back and um, make sure everyone feels good about it and talk a little bit more next time about how we can move those things forward. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense for folks? Any concerns about that? Well, yeah. what, I mean, what- Go ahead, John. Go ahead, sorry. Um, I mean, would it make, would it be useful to put out like an action agenda from CAB that because it so, says, you know, as um, Michael noted, I mean, we have we have a plans, we have lots of action ideas, um, but the idea, but we need to get actual action happening, right? <laughs> and so, and every you can't do everything all at one time. Right. Um, so, you know, perhaps there are like the first five things we really need to do are, and it might, you know there's a start of a list there. So, you know, I think this note idea about focusing on homes that use heating oil and capturing them as soon as possible with a robust program to get them to leapfrog to heat pumps is important because if they just go to natural gas, they're not going, you know, they're not going to switch for the next 20 years or more. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's critical to get them now. So I can see that being a priority. You know, I could see the home energy score being a priority. Um, and then there's some light plan issues that, you know, could be a priority. And if we put that out there, I think it's a way to help people figure out, well, what is it that we should really be doing rather than the dozens of things that are listed in the plan? Yeah, great feedback, John. Thank you. I like that. Yeah, I, I echo and agree with uh, you know what has been said so far. Just about 
process, I think, um, you know, if we can come up with that list or maybe it's three, maybe it's four top priorities. Um, and, and I think we have to be very realistic, but at the same time, it might be then helpful to have, you know, a team of two or, you know, maybe it's only one person that from the cab champions one one thing to just keep you know that one thing moving rather than trying to piecemeal it so we're all sort of doing it a little here little there but you know how you know kind of it might be a little bit based on um priority as well as you know people's interest and background and, and what you know where they feel they can really move the needle forward um you know if we can and uh do it that way so that we do get a little bit of work outside of just this, you know, one hour meeting 12 times a year. Um, that's probably the way that we're going to make some progress. And I love the idea of, of partnering with, you know, CSEC or others and, and different initiatives might have different partners, um, but really, you know, utilizing more volunteer power um, that way too. Warren, I see your hand up. Thank you, Courtney. Um, totally agree and uh, wanted to, yeah, Warren, please, please. Yeah, don't. I think this is all very good. I think your idea of voting is good. The only one thing I would urge if we have people vote, set up a system where people are constrained so that they could only can't vote for more than three things as a top priority. Okay. So that we're all forced to make some choices and not come up with everybody puts in 10 things we want to do. Okay, makes sense. I think that's a good thought. And I also, um, you know, maybe building on Courtney's points here if we really are able to key in on, you know, and I, I maybe, maybe it was Michael who said one or two priority, like really defining like what's the top one or two priorities. And I, like, I would love to see us in these meetings um, having dedicated time for those on, you know, if not every meeting, most meetings to kind of check in, you know, status update, um, even if there's nothing significant to talk about on those, just to kind of keep that, you know, keep that pulse going throughout the course of the year and the, the 12 meetings. Um, I, I don't know that we have to go quite so far as the, you know, having a, a stoplight uh, <laughs> tracking approach for, for ourselves, but I think, you know, some sort of accountability type measure for, for our own group would be helpful. And, um, and Courtney, I really like your idea of, um, you know, to the extent that it's allowed uh, outside of these meetings to have, um, you know, kind of sub, committee groups or, or whatever we would call that, um, little working groups to, to help carry some of that work forward. Yeah, I think we can have small, very small groups. It, it um, and they can work on specific items, but anything that's communicated back has to be kind of part of a meeting. So I think that we would, we would definitely wanna have for accountability and just progress. I 100% agree we should have, you know, a check-in on those priorities every time, at least on the agenda. And if there's no update, there's no update. But I think that um, that would then allow anyone who's kind of one or a couple people who are supporting that, you know, they could off cycle check in and pull together their update um, to present back. I, I think that works in terms of open meeting law. Yeah. Okay. Any other feedback, thoughts? I think I can. Yeah, I have one other comment on priorities that's of a very different nature. Um, because of turnover on this board, Courtney is now the only woman on the, the board. I think it should be a priority to restore some gender balance on this board. And we should let the town manager know that. 
I was going to suggest that, Warren. You, you and I were thinking along the same lines. <laughs> uh, I would agree. I think um, that was definitely something I was realizing and a bit um, concerned about. And I think we do have, we certainly do have room for um, another board member. Um, and I think it's just making sure we have the right fit from uh, available green cards or recruiting. Um, certainly just throw it out there. If you, if you have colleagues, friends in town um, that you think would be a good candidate, um, I know our green card list has been pretty stale overall. Um, and so it's always good to have kind of good candidates who are willing to raise their hand and just go through the process of submitting that, so. Jake, would it be possible to, um, if, I don't, if, if it's just a, a web search to find it on the Concord website, that, that's fine, but um, just to be reminded of the, guide, the, the guidance or the guideline to follow for uh, someone who may be interested in um, being considered? Sure, yeah, I can. Um... Why don't I just send, I can send that out to everyone um, just as a follow-up in terms of the link to submit a green card. Um, and then how, like basically there's a, you select, I think your top three committees that you would be willing to volunteer for. And you can just select one if you want, or you could select multiple and that's how they kind of bucket folks. And um, we just reach out to <clears throat> Jeremy in the town and he gives us kind of a spreadsheet of who's, who's kind of on the list. Um, so yeah, I can send that out. Um, great. Jake, Other this is a, this is yeah, a non -seg segue, but, um, I'm wondering what the board would think. What about, you know, the town manager is the chief executive of this town, right? And we've got a lot of committees and we've got a lot of goals and the cab has done, you know, six months of preparing a very detailed uh, plan. Would there be any benefit from us having him at some point to come to one of our meetings? Um, we would prepare an agenda, you know, obviously in advance. Maybe there's a set of questions that we would ask. Where does all of this fit, you know, into what he sees as the, the future of this town? Is he as strong or have direction that said, we really should be working on electrification, or we should be working on, um, you know, solar penetration, or, or we should be working on supply side things that he's concerned about. Is that helpful? Or does that just, you know, diffuse us from the mission that we, we think we all have? Well, I, I know Matt, um, I'll let Matt, weigh in on this question and um, I'll kind of provide some some guidance. Yeah, I think that uh, this question was asked recently, I think with regards to CSEC, but um, some similar kind of request and the answer, I, and I posed it to the town manager who responded that, you know, he, he really felt that he would like to get the new sustainability director in place and have that person kind of uh, be able to respond on behalf of the town with that kind of expertise. And I think especially given that we're just about to have a new sustainability director that that does seem, you know, like a, a worthwhile thing. I think that said, your point's well made that it does need to come from the top ultimately. And, and it would be good to see uh, kind of that leadership. I, I would just, I guess, add that I, I think I would be, I think there's an opportunity for when we have identified the priorities and we've maybe made some progress on, even if it's just progress on um, highlighting some of the challenges with progress in certain areas, I, I think there may be opportunities for us to either engage the town manager, the assistant town manager or others in, of, in uh, other town staff um, and just bring it to their attention and make sure that we're highlighting our concerns or some of the things that we're working on. 
but I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd want to have just a general kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. I think I'd like, I would want it to keep it focused and targeted um, on a couple of key topics that we really want to reinforce would be my recommendation. Um, but obviously let other folks weigh in on that as well. I mean, I think th those kinds of meetings can be a bit of theater, right? <laughs> yeah. You, you sort of are, are, you know, know before it happens how the meeting's going to go. And so, right. I don't know that we need to use the town manager's time or our time to do that, but I think there is an importance to hearing from the town manager that it's a priority and that there's a full court press going on that's coordinating uh, across departments because the sustainability director is not going to do it all. Um, and, and so I, I like the idea that figuring out uh, the right time to have the discussion and having it focus on something substantive would be useful, but I don't think we need to have a meeting that involves us giving plaudits to the town manager and the town manager sort of running through the list of things the town's doing because uh, I, don't, I don't think that will be productive. Right. But I had one other comment on priorities, but I don't know if someone else has something else to say. I don't see anyone else's hand up, so feel free, John. Yeah, so the, the other issue, of course, in the climate plan is adaptation. And so this summer has been pretty tough, right? And there's only more bad news coming out. And right. I, some, I, I'm, we have a lot on our plate, and I'm not suggesting that, that we do something differently, but I feel like that there needs to be some way to move the adaptation ball down the court as well. Um, so I, I just wanted to put that out there. I think it's a, a really good point. And um, I think Paul is, is a probably our resident expert in adaptation and he's not here. So I'm gonna sign him up for <laughs> helping. Please cab point of view on resilience and adaptation to climate change and uh, yeah. he's yeah. really good sign to help us figure that out and figure out maybe there's maybe there's a um yeah i think he could probably help maybe when he's up to speed a little bit more we could ha ask him to kind of think about how that could how that ties in and just you know, give us an overview and educate us on what he sees the opportunities are. And um, yeah, again, though, it's like we've got the prior, you know, most of our priorities are probably going to be around mitigation. So we're just going to have to be careful about, about that. Um, yeah. I mean, it might, just, you know, push us a little toward thinking about energy resilience and so all those things tied together. Um, well, there's yeah, but Paul, there. Paul's definitely the, the man. I don't know how well everyone knows Paul, but I've known him for 20 years now. And he was the first guy in the Boston area to be working on, on adaptation. And he did the first Metro Boston climate impact study. So um, he's, he's definitely the man. So. Uh, Courtney and then Warren. Um, sorry, I, I realized I never raised my hand. I apologize about that uh, on Zoom. I do in person. Um, so the go, going back to just quickly going back to the um, the conversation about the the town manager, um, you know, just wanted to I guess uh, put in a an agreement that the value in having a conversation like that, um, to me would lie in being able to um, identify the, the barriers to you know, working among um, different departments. And I think 
though ideally the sustainability director would um, help to break down some of those. Ultimately, it does kind of reside with, you know, the, the person at the top. So, so there might be value from that perspective if, you know, if we were to decide to, to discuss the priorities and, and really kind of focusing on, you know, the action of trying to bring different groups together and who those different groups are and, and kind of highlighting that. So now for that, um, and then I think the other thing related to adaptation, which I think is, you know, something we should definitely be um, thinking about as, as we think about priorities um, that, and not to bring up Envision again, but I'll just say that, you know, part of that tool does require a, a pretty in-depth look at um, how the pro any project, infrastructure or not, is um, suited for resiliency. You know how how resilient is the project? With the idea that um, you know we want to build projects that last through these you know climate changes that we you know we know are coming, as much as we're trying to mitigate for them. So um, there, you know, again, sort of a, a plug for what that tool kind of asks teams to think about. Um, it's something that. I think it, you know, in your table, the last the last line had been sustainability standards for building and infrastructure, and you know, it could be something that that comes into play there as we think either about new construction or existing retrofit. Um, you know, asking teams to design around that. Um, so, thanks, Courtney. Good good feedback and comments. Warren, I see your hand up. Yeah, a very quick point. I think there's another factor we should consider when setting priorities. I was fortunate to have an opportunity to review some of these applications for the sustainability director position. And there are some very strong candidates with strong skills and good experience. We should leverage those skills and that experience and there may be a project that rises higher to the surface because it's the type of thing that the person we hire will really be able to take the ball and run with it quickly. So, you know, anything we decide should be tentative until we know who's in the sustainability director role. Really good point. And I, I think, you know, maybe, maybe we need to, Maybe we need a top five ranked so that we have the flexibility to kick something off down the road, but try and still focus on those top three. I mean, again, the sustainability director will be here before we know it. So, um, but that's, that's helpful feedback and I think good input. Okay. Other comments, we're just at um, right about time for public comments. I don't think we have, other than Jerry, I don't see anyone, I think um, Brian had to drop off. So I don't see any other members of the public here, but were there, um, before I open it up, is there anyone, any other comments you guys wanted to make? Anything else you just had in terms of, you know, even if it's outside of prioritization, other things you'd like to see in terms of the meeting, um, meeting structure, um, or anything else. And if, if it comes to mind later, feel free to just shoot me an email. Okay. Jerry, go for it. Okay. So uh, I think you all know me, but I'm, I'm Jerry Frankel. I'm the new CSEC chair, new as of, I guess, two or three months ago. And um, much like you, you folks on this committee, we, we have, you know, the basket's overflowing of things we could do and things we want to do. Um, and uh, we also have our charter, as you have your charter. And our charter, I like to think of it as, uh, simply put, as, you know, promotion, education, you know, getting the word out there. In your case, it's advisory. Um, of course, I'm simplifying it, but uh, it's primarily advisory. And the chart that you were putting together a few moments ago, Jake, uh, had the verb 
recommend in many places. It, it was the predominant verb, the predominant action. And I think that's appropriate. But what I think is missing in what CSEC does and what CAB is doing is where is the implementation and where is the follow-up? There was discussion of follow-up. And I, I want to point out that I, I think, from my perspective, I think that's really big. That's how I think we can motivate CMLP, the town manager, and perhaps others with the follow-up. You know, we report on what our plans were, what progress did we make? No one wants to see that they haven't done anything. Um, if that's, but if that's what's happened, well, the town needs to know, town manager needs to know, Dave Wood needs to know. So at any rate, I, uh, I just want to suggest that you put some priorities on that. I'm a little out of my lane suggesting what you should do, but um, I'll, I'll take that risk. <laughs> Thank you. No, and Jerry, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not sure if you were on, but we, that was one of the things that we talked about. Um, it, and you may have needed to drop a little bit, but we talked about kind of accountability and follow up and, you know, the, the fact that we have all these key metrics in the plan and we don't really know where we are against half of them. And we also talked about, um, you know, the, one of the projects that, that you know that you and I have chatted about in terms of home heating oil conversion to electrification and I think there was a lot of um, you know I think there was a lot of excitement about how we could kind of support that and drive that forward by again shining a light on it as well as I know CSEC you can do some promotional work so appreciate that that input um, I think I think it is it's an area that we can actually, um, we, we may not be able to implement, but we can we can shine a light on failures to implement or, or challenge, you know, or congratulate, you know, right. hopefully we're doing more congratulation and encouragement than than um, you know highlighting highlighting challenges or failure to implement. Yeah, as um, actually just occurred to me, um, there is a particular example of this that maybe you might want to be aware of. So I, I do some work with MCAN, the Massachusetts Climate Action Network, and um, they are in the process, we are in the process of finishing up a report on uh, statewide MLP progress towards climate goals. This is the second one. We did the first one two or three years ago. And uh, the various MLPs, they took notice. And the ones who didn't uh, look so good in the report um, kind of got to be in their bonnet. Now, we don't know exactly what they did in response, but as we finish this next report, we'll see it. But the point here is it gets people's attention. And uh, it's a big effort, at least that one was. Um, I don't know, I, I guess I'm repeating things I previously said, so I, I'll, I'll shut up here. Um, Scorecards are good things. No, but I, I I did actually come across that report kind of earlier. It was I don't know a year or two ago, and um, I think Concord is set in set was in second place that yeah. report after Belmont. And yeah. if you think about kind of what we've been talking about and some of the challenges we feel like you know Light Pant hasn't been able to do, and it's like well if they're in second place. Um, right. you know, what are these other light, what's going on with these other light plants? But I think it's also part of it's just like the regulatory regime and the structure of how they've been set up hasn't necessarily allowed some of this. But it, it, I'm sure there's a lot, there's a lot that goes into it that I don't understand. I'm not, I have no expertise in. But um, I think the, the point is that regardless of the score, I think you, to your point, it's just, They've made commitments and some of them they're following through on others they haven't. We just need to kind of understand why and make sure that we're we're supporting progress against the climate action plan, because that's 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 one of our roles, right? That's that's a key part right. of our role. So thanks for the thanks for the input. Gary, I think you bring up a really important point. We've been wrestling from this from the beginning. If you think about, I mean, even our name. 
we, we operate in, in, a, in an advisory capacity, right? We can't direct, we can't manage. We don't have technical resources, though I would submit that probably everybody on this committee is deep technical. Um, but that notion of, of executing and implementing, like if, it, like if we were a startup and we all recognize the urgency and everyone recognizes the urgency, but the steps we're taking are so soft and we yeah. all know that. So then we ask the question, well, what would a hard step look like? And who would we piss off if we started doing hard steps? Because we're acting in the interest of the citizenry if we just sort of you know, stay in this sort of neutral position. That's why I like the fact that we're coming around to you know, two or three things that we're going to measure and evaluate the heck out of. And if our role is simply to put the spotlight on something, uh, because we can't actually go out to the street and do it, then maybe that's what we need to do is to show that spotlight. And that spotlight will show that um, where we are on target. Right. Right. How yep. many of those oil fired heating homes have we actually had any influence on whatsoever? So it's kind of moving in that direction. I'm, I'm, I'm just stymied about how hard it is to, to operate simply in an advisory position and having no um, ability to execute, right? But you raise a really good point. And I CSAC probably feels in many ways uh, uh, the same way. Yes, yes, at least I certainly do. Yeah. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't under undervalue the, uh, you know, our ability to convene, to throw the spotlight on issues. Um, yeah. I think those are powerful yeah. tools. Yep. Yeah. And I think it also just highlights the importance of identifying, you know, partners in these efforts and other collaborators, whether it's other committees or mm -hmm. local groups or individual people. But I think, I think it's a, a really good point though, Michael, of like recognizing what the limitations of this body um, are, uh, but then how we might may be able to extend our influence through, um, you know, some other creative uh, collaborations. So perhaps yeah. that's something we should be talking in, you know, about alongside our, our uh, you know, to be defined priority uh, list. Yeah, yeah I, um, I agree with you, Michael, I think the, the, the slowness with which, you know, action happens can be maddening. At the same time, there can be real value in, in this, this bringing the stakeholders along, right? And and yeah. you know, for different for the different initiatives, there'll be different stakeholders. But um, you know, when, at least in some of the work that I've done, you know, pushing a project through with very little stakeholder involvement often gets us into hot water, <laughs> right? Literally, and um, you know, but when we can bring stakeholders along and build consensus, which is a, can be a very slow process, often, not always, but often we end up with something that everyone feels uh, a part of and an and ownership in. Yeah. So, right. you know, I, I hear you <laughs> and yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think our, we should take the, li the liberty or the license to say, the climate action and resilience plan is something that multiple stakeholders were engaged in yeah. um, across the town and signed off on. And there are plenty, you know, I know there are people in this in this call, and there's plenty of citizens who are, you know, uh, feel yeah. like it doesn't go far enough or doesn't have enough teeth or what whatever it is. And some people think, you know, it goes too far, maybe. But at the end of the day, we have it as a essentially a shared resource with the town manager kind of in the intro letter. And so we can, I think, leverage that as a reinforcing mechanism, you know, again, for our advisory role purposes and for, for following through with different groups and saying, you know, we kind of agreed to this, you know, how can we help you 
drive progress. So. Agreed. Okay. Um, just a few minutes left. Any any final final comments before we um, before I entertain a motion to adjourn? I think I think we have our next steps um, as far as following up with that that survey of priorities, and then um, we'll have a kind of make sure we're aligned in the next conversation on that and talk a little bit about <clears throat> key next steps and how we want to tackle that and, and who should, who would kind of own those priorities. Um, and then, um, you know, start making sure that each meeting we're updating each other on that. So I think that's, those are, those are good outcomes for, from today's discussion. Really appreciate everyone's input. Um, and I am happy to happy to entertain a motion to adjourn unless anyone has any final comments. I move we adjourn. A second. second. All right. Can Wait. everyone just, we just do need to vote before you <laughs> so raise your hand. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you all. Really appreciate it. Have a good rest Thanks, of your evening. Bye, Take Thanks. care. Thank Bye, guys. You. Bye. Thanks, Matt. Bye.